Dodge Maltrain Outsider, Maryland Outsider here. And as you saw by the title, this is some lost videos regarding Matt Clark. These are answers to questions a lot of people were asking. And by, when I say a lot, five to 10 per question. So I filmed these and was gonna put these out, but I filmed them at the end of May, about four days, five days before Joyce and I were to leave for Germany over a two day period, uh, I filmed these. And I never got a chance to edit them. And then we went to Germany for a month. We came back, it's July, we have our kids' birthdays. And then uh, we had some projects. I was still working on little things uh, with the bedroom here. And uh, we've had other home projects. Anybody who follows this channel knows we've been doing a lot of home remodeling. And I just completely forgot about these videos. And I found them last week. I was playing around in one of my drives because it's connected with this computer. And I rarely use this computer, especially during the summer. And I was working on this computer and found one of my drives here. And I plugged it in to say, well, gee, what's on this? And, oh, here's these five videos, which I've narrowed down to four. And... So I found them last week and I didn't know what to do with them. I'm like, well, it's real out of date now because it was really something to kind of cap off the end of the Matt Clark bit. So I didn't know what to do. And I mentioned it in my live stream last Friday and three people said, no, go ahead, post them. I'd be interested in it. So I'm going to go ahead and post it. But rather than post them as separate videos, I'm doing them all as one. And this way, anybody who wants to go to it can go to it and then skip chapters as they need and watch it as they want. Because this really is answering questions. And hopefully some of you will find something interesting that I hadn't talked about before. So hope you enjoyed the videos. Take care. And this question was a series of questions from a few people. But I really remember several really good questions uh, from uh, Tammy from... Auto Railway Sun and Nancy from uh, the her railway, um, and they were asking me about uh, inspiration. What inspired um, these characters? Were they based on real people and things? And I'll, I'll try to keep it short. I won't go into all the characters specifically, uh, but the answer is again the inspiration, similar to the video of what is Matt Clark? It's the inspiration was um, a joke that uh, Randall Ellison and I started in the live stream that inspired the thought and to um, start writing the, these comedy bits. But the inspiration uh, behind the characters is not any real people with a couple of exceptions. The inspiration is just to parody stereotypes, archetypes as we call them in literature and drama and so forth, uh, of characters you would see in a Western. And this whole concept, this whole series was based on um, serial movies that uh, were very popular in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, uh, even into the 60s, even in the 70s as a... Um, very early 70s i remember going to um a saturday cinema and what you would get is you'd get a couple of cartoons uh and then there would be this serial um a chapter of many chapters uh of a science fiction or western or even superhero i i remember in the 40s well i don't remember the 40s uh but there were batman serials there was uh westerns there were uh rocky jones and the space rangers buck rogers in the 25th century all of these uh things uh and you would just get uh one 10 15 minute segment each week sort of like a tv show before there were tv shows uh and then you'd have to come back the following week to get the next episode and that was the real inspiration so the characters themselves really are not inspired by any real people things they're just based on archetype repeated characters that you would see in my case in westerns um or 
certain types of characters you'd see in serials. For example, uh, Smokey, the precocious 10-year-old, is based on multiple characters. Uh, Bobby in Rocky Jones and the Space Rangers. Uh, Billy in um, Undersea Kingdom. There was always these little nine, ten-year-old kids that knew too much, were too precocious, and always trying to tag along and get in with the hero and got themselves mixed up in the adventures and so forth. And the idea is to take these archetypes and, and twist them a bit. Um, try to do something with these characters that is not frequently done. Um, you know, because... I'm not the first one to do satire or parody anything. Obviously, it's a long art. But, uh, you know, to avoid trying to do another um, Blazing Saddles, which did the same thing. It took stereotypes, archetypes of uh, types of characters and human behaviors associated with the Old West and turned them on the air. Now, he did what I call 180 humor. And uh, I prefer... 90 degree humor where you or 270 degree humor where um you take a character and just slightly twist it um rather than um play to the exact opposite of the character you know like uh, the uh for example an archetype in westerns is the brave sheriff good strong incorruptible um you know, lawman, you know. Um, and so a 180 of that is your Inspector Clouseau, your um, Don Not Shakiest Gun in the West. So a twist of that, a 90 degree or 270 twist on that, is uh, Sheriff Buck, who, yes, he's the cowardly archetype, but unlike those other cowardly archetypes, he is blatantly open and proud of his cowardice. Now, um, having said that, um, you do. You take all those different types of characters. You know, like there's always the saloon and there's the piano player guy and there's the singer and, you know, there's the girl, um, the love interest of the, the He-Man sheriff. It, and we play upon all that. We give them little twist. Um now, so none of my characters, except for a couple I'll mention, are based on anybody real. It's not based on any TV show. It's not based on any movie characters, with the exceptions I will bring up now. But otherwise, the inspiration is just um, taking the standard archetypes of a Western and twisting them a little bit and putting in concepts and ideas that you would not find in a western you know surprise people with that as well as all the fourth wall breaks and uh um and um running jokes uh, and things like that uh but uh, there are a couple of characters uh in the villains area that are kind of based on um real people so i'm going to start with stanley steamer over here the master um tycoon railroad tycoon evil railroad tycoon he is sort of an amalgam of my personal prejudices against all the captains of industry i learned about in school the guys from the american industrial revolution you know they were um beyond capitalism they were they were monopolists they you know they were trying to corner markets and uh control everybody's lives that they could william hurst and the media and so on um and uh so stanley steam here is sort of an amalgam of all my prejudices against such men uh, but he's not based on anyone in particular if anything the primary inspiration uh for stanley steam here is uh and I didn't do this um, ahead of time. It's just if you want a character that he really is most like, it's not an actual living person, uh, it would be go to 1947, I think the movie came out, uh, the James Stewart Christmas classic, It's a Wonderful Life. He is a variation, a twist on Mr. Potter, the, the villain, the bad man of um, It's a Wonderful Life. That's who he is 
who he is. Uh, he's really just um, another variation of that archetype. The one character that is truly based on a specific human being, and this is where I could offend quite a few people who follow this channel, but those type of people I think would have run away scared from this channel a long time ago, uh, is that guy right below me, the Reverend Saltine. Okay? If you think about his last name, now, for those who don't know, Reverend Saltine is a secondary villain in Series 2 and the main villain in the uh, second Christmas special. Uh, Reverend Saltine comes to Big Gulch, uh, a fire and brimstone preacher, preaching his uh, brand of religion called Frisbetarianism. And um, he preaches the, the words of the lost prophet Freebius and... Uh, it's all very hokey. It's clearly a hokey religion. He even admits he, you know, he bought the rights to the religion for fifty dollars under the New York under uh, the Brooklyn Bridge in New York. Um, okay, it's it's not specifically an attack on any particular religion or anything. It's just a vehicle to for this character's motivation. But he uh, is a fire and brimstone guy. Um, evangelical all the way but his name saltine is a type of cracker and there's another famous and he's billy saltine somebody shooting off fireworks um i don't know if you're hearing the pops here billy saltine well there's another famous minister evangelical fire and brimstone preacher uh whose name was billy and his last name was a type of cracker billy graham um but um Reverend Saltine is, um, his name at least is, I, I don't base his character on the mannerisms of Billy Graham. He's based on all those fire and brimstone evangelical ministers that you would have had back then. Um, but his name and, and that is definitely a parody of, uh, of, uh, Reverend Billy Graham. The only other character that um, has any sort of connection to anything outside my own imagination would be going back to the main characters. And this is one that was a little bit of fun is uh, the horse there, um, Goliath. Most people assumed Goliath was based on Mr. Ed. And that's totally understandable, talking horse Mr. Ed. Of course, Mr. Ed himself was based on Francis the Talking Mule from those uh, O'Connor movies, uh, Donald O'Connor movies, I believe it was Donald O'Connor. And uh, he's just, uh, uh, but he's not based on that. Uh, horse, he's a horse simply because it's the Old West and you need a horse. Uh, but his name was, and his voice was the giveaway of what he's really based on. He is based on a um 60s uh religious cartoon um although when i was a kid i guess i didn't quite catch that it was that religious but it was uh davy and goliath davy was a nine-year-old boy uh, much like Smokey, and nine ten year old and goliath was a talking dog what's a disaster that's when bad things happen to people in the world that curiously only davy heard talking nobody else heard Goliath talk um, and in that series uh, Goliath um, the first few episodes Goliath is kind of like the naive novitiate you know trying to learn about the morals of Christianity but then very quickly the writers must have realized that that was an awkward way to work it and so um, very quickly they changed and Goliath became uh, sort of the guardian angel, you know, the voice of God, the voice of Christian morality, who would occasionally try to steer Davy away from precocious behavior or warn Davy away from those that were um, being behave. And Goliath, the dog, gee, Davy, maybe it was God who intervened, you know, um, which is why. Of all the characters' voices I do, Goliath is the one that is a straight impersonation because I, I, want, I was hoping people would get it. I, I was shocked nobody seemed to recognize the voice Goliath. I am not the only person who watched that cartoon. Now, clearly they're two very different characters. Uh, 
Goliath the dog was a um there there are similarities too i mean that was the whole point was uh, goliath would try to talk sense you know proper values into davy and if you go to series 2 goliath the horse and if you pay attention goliath is very kinky uh he's a very kinky horse um but he also tries to as Smokey is falling under the spell of Reverend Saltine and the burn them all and they all must be punished sort of thing. It's it's uh, Goliath who's speaking common sense saying, gee, Smokey, maybe you're being a judgmental asshole. Um, you know, it's done in that same delivery and style that um, Smokey did. Um, and so that is what the inspirations of this are. otherwise it's just um i needed characters to fulfill roles and just mock the whole genre um i i'm not trying to put my own social criticisms in here other than my belief that you, you should accept everybody everybody regardless of intelligence race gender sexual preference sexual gender identity uh stuff you just you know they're not hurting you. Leave them alone. Um, and that might sound preachy, but that's the message from the people of Big Gulch. Is that's why Big Gulch is a kind of a cool town. A little silly, a little backwards in some ways, but it's a town where everybody likes each other. Everybody gets along. Everybody, you, you fly your freak flag, we'll fly ours, and we just leave each other alone. And, um, and, but that was never the agenda. That was never the agenda for the show was to be preachy it was just a vehicle for comedy to uh have all these people be wild without condemnation coming in they're just uh so when it comes to inspiration the inspiration is parody taking the archetypes the the very consistently appearing characters in westerns and twisting them a bit and then just giving them you know, as you go on, you develop the character and so forth. So it's, um, they're outside of maybe Reverend Saltine. They're not based on anybody real or living. Uh, and again, Goliath is based on a TV show character um, and not Mr. Ed, although I totally get why everybody thinks Mr. Ed. Um, and it still works, you know, Mr. Ed the Talking Horse with Wilbur and so forth. And I've got a talking horse. But the true parody is Goliath the Talking Dog from Davy and Goliath. And then Stanley Steamer is just kind of an amalgam of all the captains of industry and the great tycoons of the late 1800s, the late 19th century. But otherwise, the inspiration was just my uh, need to put very um, anarchic, um, subversive and uh, off the wall stupid humor together and m make f a parody of those old serials uh, from the 30s, 40s, and 50s specifically the western ones but whether it was a western or a space science fiction one because even science fiction movies are just westerns in outer space um so I hope that uh, gives you some insight, and it may offend a couple of people, but uh, there it is. That is the inspiration to uh, the characters and the town of uh, Big Gulch. So until... And this video is going to um, answer questions that um, go all the way back to my friend Tim, Tim Dow, Tim JD. Uh, longtime friend of the channel, uh, all the way up through uh, Dwight Curley and uh, George from Florida Railroad Dog. Um, they all asked various forms of questions about how I do the voices. As far as doing the voices, um, you know, I, I, I remember George uh, specifically asked, how do you remember them all? So um, just want to touch on that. Uh, when I create a character... And this goes back to my childhood. This goes back to when I would read stories to my kids. When I create a character, I have an idea of who that character is and uh, what they would sound like. And that's, again, I talked about when making the videos, looking for the pictures until I say, ah, 
there's my sheriff. Oh, there's Mayor Sumbish right there. There's Daisy. Um, or asking if friends want to be characters and then changing the images they send me until they become that character. But uh, once I have the character, then I want to voice that what fits that person. You know, that fits both their personality and, you know, that when you look at that person, you say, yeah, that voice would come from that person. And then the voice would also carry some of their personality and persona in it. You know, for example, when Joyce does Daisy, you know, the coaching was, I want a bit of a Southern girl, Southern flirt. Um, you know, the old term was cock tease. Um, uh, a little Southern tease, a little... Um, seductress but i just wanted as sugary sweet a southern girl as possible um now what happens is so you you have in your head an idea of where you want that voice to be and some people just don't naturally do a lot of different voices you know it, i've been doing voices since i was a kid so creating a character voice and i'll talk about buck over here for a second um you know, when I see that character, I knew I wanted him to have a very gruff, gravelly voice. Now, I could have done an Oscar the Grouch kind of voice from Sesame Street, but, you, you know, the one that came to mind was Yosemite Sam. But I didn't just do Yosemite Sam because there's an issue. When you have a character and then you give them a famous voice, a voice of a famous actor, a voice of a famous character then subconsciously your audience, if they know that character, will project their attitudes, their feelings about that character onto your new character. So I gave Buck Yosemite Sam's voice, straight Yosemite Sam. People may be looking at Buck, but they're going to be seeing and hearing Yosemite Sam. So it had to be something in that vein, but it couldn't be. Well, this is where my years of studying, um, listening to top impressionists and comedians talk about how they do voices, uh, how they learn to uh, do impressions, but also voice actors who talk about um, not redoing somebody else's voice. In other words, uh, when you're trying to create a character like Wacko in... Uh, Animaniacs, um, that he wanted him to sound kind of like Ringo from the Beatles, but he didn't want him to be Ringo from the Beatles, but kind of that Liverpudlian uh, dingle accent, um, you know, so that the character stands, so that the character stands apart from, so that the character stands apart from the real person you're portraying so anyhow with buck what we do, we learn is that when we do voices when we speak uh first of all there are a lot of different body parts that get used in speaking uh to make sound and it's your lips teeth tongue obviously vocal cords but it's also how you move air through your nasal passage and your oral cavity um and you can move where the sound coming from your mouth, you can move it around in your mouth. Um, for example, when you do Yosemite Sam, don't sneeze now, you a dragon. That's way in the back of the throat. That's It's all held back in here. So what I do is I start there. I start with Yosemite Sam. I do Yosemite Sam. And then in Buck's case, I moved it around until I found it in a way where I... I felt it worked differently. And in this case, I I still have it in the back of the throat, but I'm pushing air and the, the sound is actually coming off the top of my palate. Instead of it's all coming from the back of my throat, it's actually starting in the back of my throat, but then it kind of reverberates off my front palate right behind my front teeth. So, the best kind, Sheriff. I keep surviving. You know, now all of a sudden it's in the front of the mouth as opposed to all in the back. I don't... I don't know if that comes across on a microphone or not. And even then, it might still be kind of confusing, you know. But it's something you, you learn to practice. 
you know where you put a voice is the voice coming from the front of your mouth is it coming from the back of your throat are you doing it tight-lipped or are you doing it wide mouth you know those all affect the accent and the voice and i don't when i say accent i don't mean dialect just the way their words sound coming out okay so um so that was buck and what happens is um you once you come up with a voice you say that's it you practice it you just keep doing it until you you're consistent with it you know how you're doing it um, and a couple of different ways you do that is you give them a catchphrase um, you like with uh, to get into the sheriff there's little things we call mnemonic devices things to help you remember uh, with the sheriff it's um, um, his phrase, the best kind, your honor, I keep surviving. What kind of coward, you know, because um, Mary Sumbition seen one says, what kind of a coward are you? And Buck says, the best kind, your honor, I keep surviving. Um, and that becomes my memory line, my mnemonic device, my memory bit. Uh, I say that and that gets me working it. But early on, you just have to keep talking in that voice for a few minutes until your brain registers it. And then you can always go back, once you record it, you can go back and listen to it. Like uh, if it's been six months since I've done Buck's voice, I will first do the mnemonic line that gets me into his voice and character. Or if that I'm not feeling it, I'll play back episodes and i'll hear it and your brain then starts you know because it's your voice doing it your brain says oh yeah we remember how that works you know it's muscle memory um and so we do that for example um and you write notes um anybody who does voices writes little notes like with with buck i originally wrote uh yosemite yosemite sam front of mouth okay just little little notes like that um Matt Clark starts as Elvis Presley. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. A hunk, a hunk of burning love. Thank you. Now, Smokey. Lil darling. You know, then you throw in the, you know, you say, so I might write a note. Um, Elvis Presley. Texified. You know, I, I give him a bit of a Texas accent. And, um, you know, just little notes when I'm first starting, you know, to help me get to him. So, when I first created Matt Clark, I would go to my Elvis impersonation, which isn't great. Thank you. Thank you very much. But then I make it fuller because when you when you're doing an Elvis, you kind of keep your your um, you keep your throat tight. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And you kind of keep your lip. But Matt talks a little bit louder and wider with that West Texas accent. Um, Silas Sumbish is Foghorn Leghorn from uh, the Warner Brother cartoons, Merry Melodies, Looney Tunes. Um, he's Foghorn Leghorn, but then taken more to extreme with an East Kentucky accent, of which I have some relatives that are from down there and, uh, you know, just imitate that. And in fact, he and Matt Clark are very sim similarly toned characters. I could get lost between the two at times, especially in Series 3 where I was spending... I, w I did uh, five, six, seven scenes and voices, and by, by the time I was doing the fifth or sixth scene of Matt Clark voices, I was getting a little tired or doing Silas Sumbish, which requires a little bit more work because uh, he's got that vibrato in his voice, that East Kentucky, you know, upper-class East Kentucky plantation, oh, no, vibrato, you know, kind of a Colonel Sanders voice. But, you know, you go to Foghorn Leg on, I keep a pitching him, you keep a Now, dog, hey, dog, hey, boy, you got any of those long-haired books? Um, but you give it more vibrato, and you do that. But you make it a little note, okay, go to Foghorn Leg on more vibrato, um, slightly deeper. Um, other voices... Uh, Donna Lott, for example, uh, I just wanted her to sound erudite and upper class, but she's my, she's my mocking Queen of England voice. Not that I was trying to do Elizabeth, just, oh, peasants! You know, I used to do that all the time with my students and everything else when I would mock royalty or something like that. I'd always do the Queen. Hello, peasants! Off with his head! You know, just, to, and it's done a lot, except uh, I twisted a bit to do, um, 
I wanted her to sound very educated and erudite, but you know, I don't write English accent. Um, there's actually a specific name. Um, Donna Lott speaks with an accent very similar, and Crazy Hawk does too, uh, has a dialect um, that's actually an invented one. Um, it was started in the late 1800s, the um, late Victorian age in the United States, uh, by an East Coast professor um, who came from a very upper crust established family. And he felt that the American accent was too common, that, you know, rich and poor, you know, there were, there were definitely neighborhood and city and regional dialect differences, but that, you know, the upper class uh, of the United States may have spoken educatedly, more educated than the average huckster on the street, but it wasn't snooty enough. And literally this guy began teaching the upper crust of the Hamptons and so for that region of the United States to speak in a certain language. And maybe the most famous speaker of that dialect was William Buckley, uh, the conservative political pundit. But uh, they had this, you know, now he, he wasn't speaking with a fake accent. He was brought up to speak that way. But it started as a fake accent that a large population of uh, the upper class on the East Coast adopted. And they now speak that way. And that's how they learn to speak. It's, it's now an actual dialect. But it started as a made up dialect um, and uh, spread, you know, as a. This is how we talk. We all blah, blah. and it sound and it was meant to sound English, except it's a very, it's not English, and she has that dialect. William Buckley had that dialect. Uh, quite a few uh, American uh, public speakers have that dialect, and it's very different than the Bostonian Pakyaka um, sort of thing. It's a, uh, uh, it's a very erudite, um, very proper sounding. You know, of course, we you know. Um, but it was based on a stereotype of the Queen's English. Uh, but it, it's not British, but it was meant to try to sound that sort of proper, regal English way. So that is, um, you know, how we do it. And then we have mnemonic devices for each of them. Like Smokey would be, ah, shucks, or it's all a bunch of horse poop. So once you create a voice, and I don't want to go through and explain how I create every voice, um, but once you get there, um, you then create the mnemonic device, the, the phrase that gets you to them. Now, just kind of to finish that. So every time you create a character, um, you got to have a backstory. Who are they? Uh, I had a professor that said, whenever you introduce a character into anything you're producing, whether it's a poem, a play, a script of some kind, um, even if the character is only going to be there for 10 seconds, you should have in your head a backstory, a history of who that character is and what brought them there. Even if it's the waitress at a diner who's just going to walk up and say, can I take your order? Um, because everything that's happened in their life up to that moment will determine how they would say, can I take your order, please? Um, if they've had a, you know, a relatively happy day, hey, can I take your order, please? And if they have just, their life's been a failure and being a waiter or waitress was not something they foresaw for themselves and now they're stuck in this job because they got no other choice, the bills are overdue, can I take your order, please? Um, there's, you have a backstory. And so some of that is knowing their nationality, like uh, Cog is Norwegian and Ivor is Swedish. And there's ver a lot of difference between those. Now, again, the average person doesn't have a degree in linguistics and studies accents and dialects and language that they would um, know, know really how to differentiate between the two. And I'm not going to do a class on that now. But I am lucky in that I have a degree in linguistics and how languages are formed and the way we create um, our spoken sounds um, and then on the flip side of that you have uh, you know and plus it was an interest a hobby something I enjoy doing then on the flip side of that is uh, somebody like Joyce who um, really never you know had the interest of doing 
voices. I mean, she didn't grow up mimicking everybody and everything. I'm sure she had voices that she might have done here and there, but she didn't put the time and study trying to imitate every cartoon character and um, every TV show and, and song and commercial and stuff like that. Uh, it wasn't a passion or an interest of hers. So now in her in her 50s, uh, asking her to try to create voices because I know how I want those characters to sound in my head but I've got to get her to do it and I think she would freely admit that um, trying to do different voices uh, is a little harder because she hasn't had school and classes in it and and uh, um, she's going to have very little patience on having me try to teach her how to do all these things so it's just Okay, honey, try to do a southern voice and do this. But like Trudy, um, who is supposed to be German, and getting Joyce to do a German accent. And yes, her husband's a German teacher, uh, was a German teacher, but also an English teacher and history teacher and all that. But uh, to get her to do a, um, a German accent, somebody who has never in her life, just as a joke, tried to do a French accent, a Japanese accent, a... German accent and anything and all of a sudden try to say okay this is how you learn to do it you know in German especially Prussian German you will pronounce these syllables this way and these vowels this way and so when Trudy talks you have to learn to do it. you know I could do Trudy accent better than Joyce but um, it's fun having Joyce do Trudy um, even though it's not a great Prussian accent Joyce has given it a life of its own, which makes it more fun. Yeah, um, and it's just somebody who's never done voices trying to learn to do voices. And even with Daisy and Lil, there can be a struggle between, ah, you're, you're doing more Lil than Daisy right now. Because, you know, to her, a southern voice and a western voice are kind of the same. And uh, um, she has to really go to her mnemonic devices a lot to get into those characters. So once you get the character, you know, you decide how you want them to sound, it's just repetition and then um, have your callbacks, your mnemonic devices. And again, when all else fails, you go back and listen to previous scenes and that usually jogs your brain into it. When you create 130 spoken characters like we've had, yeah, it can be hard to keep them straight. So especially lesser characters, um, if they haven't, like, right now I couldn't even think, how do I do Nat Mayfault? I would have to go play Christmas special number one to remember Nat Mayfault, the station master's voice. I would not be able to, I don't remember it right now. Uh, I'd have to look at the uh, my notebook and see uh, what notes I wrote, and then I'd probably still go to the video and go, okay, I need to hear it again, and then I, I'll remember it. But, uh, so I hope maybe that gave some insight on how we do the voices. Again, anybody can do voices. It, it's just like anything you do. Um, it's repetition, practice, and a desire to want to do it. And in this one, uh, I'm going to answer the question of how did I do the show? People asked me about how I did the animation or the voices, so I thought I would talk about that real quick. Um, the show is a um, what we call a vocalized comic strip. Now, if you know a comic strip from the old newspapers and Sunday papers, uh, it's a series of pictures with word balloons. Well, we take that and give you the series of pictures, um, but we do actual voices. There's no real animation to it. It's not a cartoon. It's not animated, although occasionally we do stick in some animation, very low budget. Um, so what we do is we create, as you see around me, a group of characters that I pull, and all the images are pulled off Google. I do Google image searches, and I pull these characters, and then I beginning in, uh, with the Christmas special after series one, I green screened out the backgrounds. If you watch series one, I didn't even green, I just, I had a background image that represented the location they were at. And then I just uh, layered the way these characters are layered. 
Uh, I just layered their pictures um, on top of each other in my video editing software. I use Nero ahead um, video editing software. It's old, it's archaic, it's a little behind the times, but it works. I'm used, I've been using it for 20 years, so um, it, it works for me and I'm used to it and all its nuances and I've tried other things and I just it just doesn't work as well for me I'm just too used to Nero I guess anyhow so that's how we do it we we find pictures now it's a involved process of when I create a character how you know how do I create that character well I create a character and I have in my head how I want that character to look so it's off to Google image search and I'll type in, you know, uh, old man sheriff, for example. Let's talk about Sheriff Buck Bannon, you know, old pioneer, old west sheriff. And uh, I might have to alter words, pioneer sheriff, you know, old, old gunslinger, whatever, you know. And um, I just keep looking, and then I'll see an image like that when I go, there's my sheriff. He's the age, he's the look I wanted for my sheriff. Sometimes the search is real fast, sometimes it takes forever and then we have to worry about copyright is the image copyrighted blah 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 and we try to avoid that but like uh the daisy cockett image here that's uh uh it's an image from one of their uh i think legs fifth avenue uh, uh or rosy uh costumes you know native american princess costume you know not very uh politically correct but uh when i saw it i said there's daisy you know kind of a sexy well, definitely a sexy looking, etc. Um, and uh, so what we do is we have the characters and then I have to have backgrounds. Where is this occurring? So as I write the plot, that's the first thing that happens. I write the plot and the plot writing could be an episode of its own. But I it, it goes in a process. First, I have a general idea of where I want it to start, where I want it to go. And then I start thinking certain jokes come to mind. Okay, I'll write those jokes down in notes in a notebook. Like, okay. And then how do I fit those jokes while I go from where the plot's going to begin to where it ends? And then I start writing the scenes. And a joke will come up and I'll say, well, I'll have to rewrite this scene and part of that scene to help explain this joke and set this joke up. Um, but once we write the, the, the plot um, and then I start filling in the dialogue, then we we produce the cartoon so i look for images of the characters um and then i uh, once i find it uh, i now green screen out using microsoft paint i just whatever the background is so all these characters have had background parts of their pictures green screened out so then i pick locations and in many cases i layer it to alter the picture so it doesn't violate copyright rules and that takes a lot of time because in many cases I have to green screen certain things out again, eliminate certain images, erase certain things, add certain things where I have to take another picture and green screen everything out of that picture, but one or two parts that I then uh, layer onto it. And I use my video editing software to create that background picture. And then I put the characters on. So all the characters that are going to be in that scene, they're all in front of the same background. We don't bother trying to adjust angles like, well, this guy technically is on this side of the room, so different wall. No, they're in this room. We have a picture to sell the, back, the concept of they're in this room. Because, again, we are not a production house trying to do high-quality stuff. It's Everything is quick and cheap like um, everything else that involves the world of Big Gulch. But the layering and the putting the pictures together, um, sometimes it takes an hour just to green screen one character out of a picture um, to then layer them in just to do one character. But once I have all those pictures for a scene, then uh, what we do is the second half of this is we then record the voices. We record the voices before we put the scene together but we create the images of the characters in the backgrounds, then we record the voices, and then we um, put it all together. So that's the second step, is um, when we record the um, voices. Now, a lot of people, and I got asked this by several people. Um, I know um, Dwight Curley asked me about this uh, from Curley Express. I know George from Florida Railroad Dog. Um, questioned us about this, uh, other people did. Um, 
And a lot of people assume that Joyce and I just sit down and read the script and act out the scenes. And no, we, we don't. Um, to answer Dwight's question, do we crack up laughing all the time and have to redo the takes? We do occasionally crack up laughing, but we do not act the scenes out and record it. What we do is we record each character separately. Like uh, if Matt Clark is in a scene, I will just read the script and record Matt Clark's lines. And of course, I know what emotions he should be saying with each line. And I'll occasionally ad lib or all of a sudden think of a line and add it in. Sometimes I have to go back and rewrite the whole script and record a new voice or something like that because I've added something to the scene. But I just record all of Matt Clark's line. Then all of... Uh, somebody else's lines uh the sheriff or whatever now i do save certain characters for last anytime i'm doing the characters for a certain scene if buck or rusty twinger are in the scene i save their voices for last because uh both buck and rusty have very scratchy voices and that irritates my throat um in series three i actually did multiple scenes at a time like i did all matt clark's lines for five six scenes in a row and all buck's lines for five six seven scenes in a row and i just did them all ahead of time and by the time i was on two or three scenes of buck my throat was just raw so you have to time and be careful with certain voices um, and then the next step is once we have the voices um, recorded I just sit down on my video editing software and I pull all the vocal um, tracks in and um, I start just splicing in one picture at a time. Okay, this character's talking, so them in front of the background. This character's talking, them in front of the background. Then I add, uh, well, I actually, I put the vocal track in first and then I put the picture in to line up with the vocal track. So I just go over to the vocal track, snip out the line I need, slide it over into place, put the picture on it, next vocal track that person's picture in and then whoever speaks next there's and it, it's it's a long process uh for a 10 minute um scene it'll take me anywhere from two to six hours to put it all together and that's not counting the recording time but uh then there's layering in additional special sound effects we don't always use background side of side effect uh sound effects not side effects background sound effects but in many scenes, we think it's necessary, so I put those in. Oh, well, we need some crowd noise in the background. We we want some crickets chirping here. We, um, yeah, we just keep adding things and adding things. Um, and then there's special effects. So, yeah, uh, we had one scene uh, in Series 3 and a couple of scenes in Series 2 that took me probably two, three four days to put the entire scene together and i'm talking working anywhere from five to six hours a day at least on that um so we had a couple of scenes that probably took me uh, anywhere from 18 to 25 hours to put the entire scene together uh, because they were very layered lots of images and sound effects and everything going on so even as cheap as it looks there's a lot of work that goes into that and, and that, that's how we do it um and, and the one of the last things is um, is before it finishes production is we have to come up with a name for the scene. And we try to have the name be funny to some degree and have some sort of reference to both the real world but also uh, what's going on in the scene. Um, and uh, sometimes that, that's the hardest thing of all. What, what do we name this scene? Um, because when I'm writing the script, I just put scene two at the itchy crotch scene three outside where's mine scene four at out of the woods you know and then but i like to give the scenes titles because all the serial scenes had titles so that is believe it or not um a fairly concise and uh that that's how we do it so we i write the script Actually, I write a rough outline of the overall plot. Then I start thinking of certain jokes that got to be in there, or I've even thought of jokes first and how am I going to fit them into the plot and might even write the plot around the joke. Um, and then we pick the images of the characters and the backgrounds. Where, where are these scenes taking place? And then we layer it all together in video editing software. We record the voices um, and then 
we spliced the pictures we put in the audio track first and then splice the pictures over the audio track so that when one person's speaking their image shows up but sometimes i'm dealing with so many Im images there are glitches but that's how we make the series that's how we make the shows hey everybody Anthony Dodge Mile Train Outsider of the Maryland Outsider here, uh, answering a whole bunch of questions regarding favorites of uh, favorite characters, favorite scenes. Uh, who who did I enjoy writing for? Who maybe I didn't enjoy? Um, so I'm gonna break this down into uh, favorite characters, uh, but really that's goes along with the writing question: What characters did I like writing the most for? And uh, then I'll talk about maybe some of my favorite scenes. Uh, but out of 60 some scenes and two Christmas specials with multiple scenes in them, um, uh, I could be here hours analyzing it all. And I'll clearly forget scenes. I'm like, oh yeah, I like that scene. So anyhow, let's break it down and talk about characters uh, that are my favorite. And the, the short and easy answer is I don't have a favorite character. Um, I like all the characters I created and some get more lines and more bits just because they're more important to the plot lines. It doesn't make them my favorite. Um, but there are characters I definitely have a little more fun writing bits for. Uh, for example, uh, in season three, um, these two over here were just a blast to write all the scenes because, um, without repeating the plot line too much by season three these two have totally committed to each other and uh their relationship is just blatant open no holds barred it's all fun and games and uh i i really had no um censor uh these two could say and do what they want in regards to each other and they were just a lot of fun to write in season three uh daisy has always been a fun character to write for uh just because she is sort of um a heterosexual male um fantasy the very sensuous seductive sexy vixen um but very open and intelligent not a dumb bubble-headed bleach blonde um just uh, a very um out there character but lil also is is um a character and Joyce will eventually someday do a video where she talks about her um, interpretations of these female characters uh, but definitely in series three these two were just a blast to write because uh, there was no censoring it was just let it all hang out with them and so I had a lot of fun writing them um, I enjoyed, especially in series one, but even in series two, I just I enjoyed uh, writing our buddy uh, Five Finger and then Four Finger and briefly Three Finger Bill. Um, he was a lot of fun to write with. Um, he did become many viewers' favorite character. There are a lot of people that just love bill uh i write i i liked writing bobby the kid and performing bobby the kid was a lot of fun in C in series one uh since i'm here on the villains uh i love um if there's a character especially a villain because i did specifically get asked my favorite villains um i you know it's tough for me to pick i i liked writing for and doing four finger five finger bill um pick a number finger bill um, and Bobby, I, I, I love the whole interaction of Bobby's gang and all of Bobby's gang and the jokes I wrote for them. If I didn't like it, they wouldn't have been done. Um, but if I, maybe there's one I liked a bit more, it, it, it's a flip of the coin, but I really love the Kahat. Uh, I loved writing for the Kahat. I'm a huge Cat Stevens fan. Uh, and coming up with all these funny ways to incorporate Cat Stevens songs and then just uh, having that James Mason voice in my head um, and uh, just having him talk and do all his silly um, opium banter, the hippies around him and that, 
and just the the Maharishi sort of persona he tries to project. Uh, I I had a lot of fun writing him. Um, some characters not pictured. Uh, the elves in the first Christmas special. Th those were uh, some favorite characters. I really enjoyed writing the elves in the first Christmas special, which I still think was just a perfect... Uh, it, it, it was a one-hour movie that um, there's very little I would have changed in it, even looking back two years later. But uh, as far as so many characters, um, you know, it's... I love doing the SECS, but again, it's not so much the individual characters, it's their interactions with Mayor Sumbish and Daisy, especially Daisy. On the other hand, I found uh, Sheriff um, Dannon hard to write for after series one. I found I was doing scenes and then really not giving him many lines and thinking, oh, I need to give him something to say here. Um, I have some good plot lines with him, but I don't feel like I was limited by his character at all. It just, I was so busy writing the plot and the other characters, I sometimes go back and go, wow, Buck's just sitting there while everybody else is talking. He would have had to have said something. Um, and so it's not that he was... I, I, I love the character of Buck. I think Buck's great, but... Um, the plots just kind of seemed to evolve um, off of him, and I often had to go back and put him in um, and give him some lines and even rewrite some things to incorporate him more and bring him back. I just found I was subconsciously leaving him out. So clearly, uh, I, I, I don't know if I'd say found it difficult to include him. It just, I seem to be excluding him unintentionally a lot. Um, Diesel Dan is one that, uh, again, I don't think I didn't like writing for him, but I did find um, I often wasn't thinking about him as I'm writing scenes. I'm like, oh, well, Dan's here and Dan needs to say a couple of things. Uh, very similar. Um, and Dan, in fact, I've mentioned in other videos, Dan had um, originally, before I started writing the rest of series one, Dan was going to be a much bigger and more important character than he wound up becoming. He's still Matt's sidekick and best male friend, um, um, but uh, he definitely had a diminished role um, through the series than he was supposed to have had when I first conceived of his character. Um, Smokey is not easy to write for, um, he has, um, uh, he, he's, there's a lot of fun. I mean, in some ways he is easy to write for, but coming up with rants because in season one, his rants are so off the wall and always end, they get darker. First of all, each rant starts with no smoky. You can't do this. No, you know, simplistic complaints like a kid would have. But then the last couple of lines always add something like dark and suggestive where you go and, uh, you know, and now Smokey, don't tell anybody about the pictures we took. You know, I'm going to leave that up to your imagination, uh, which is the best joke not to explain it. You know, did he walk in on pictures? Did, you know, what was going on? Of course, you got to think of uh, what you might think they're referring to. And the fact that in the 1890s, uh, photography still was a much more involved and tedious process than it is. Uh, it would be 20, 30 years later. Um, but... Uh, so writing his rants after I had such dark rants in the first series uh, became fun. That's why series three, I had a lot of fun writing Smokey because the running joke was every time he starts a rant, he gets cut off. And that was a great um, uh, bit to do. And then I finally have the one rant where, um, you know, going into f favorite scenes where he starts ranting and he's waiting to be cut off and nobody does. And he... <laughs> whoa, nobody's interrupted me, you know, um, and it's almost to him like nobody cares anymore, like nobody cares about me, you know, they're just ignoring my rant, they didn't interrupt me, nothing, you know, and that comes into play later in the story. Uh, Goliath is another character, the horse here, and uh, I had a, I have a blast writing for Goliath because like the relationship with Daisy, Little Beaver, and, um, and Silas there, um, 
Goliath just there's no there's no inhibitions there's no um, there's there's no censor and Goliath is just complete off the wall perv pansexual talking horse um, anytime anywhere with anything um, and I, I love right doing that kind of writing in fact I'll bring in one of the questions here. Uh, somebody asked, why is there so much kinky stuff? It's because, because it shocks people. You know, and there's a great series of reactions, but um, th the sad thing is I don't get to see the reactions, but you have everybody from the very uptight moral life, like, you should talk about that. That's disgusting and wrong. You know, it's sick and evil and perverted to the people are like, hey, man, he's talking about my little hidden hobby, you know. Um, you know, the whole gamut of reactions to it. And as a comedian, you just, you like to, I don't believe in crossing a line just to, to show I crossed the line that, you know, I'm pushing the boundary. But yeah, you like to throw some comedy that gets some people, not all people, but some people out of their comfort zone and just see who laughs or who gives annoying smile and who's just like, Ooh. And then even the people like, what is he talking about? What's a bit gag? I have no idea what that is. Um, these shows in Tijuana, what's he talking about? But for the people who know what we're referencing, that's a, you know, that's a, that's a laugh for them or a wicked smile. So he was another character that was fun to write for. And um, again, some were just a little bit easier. Matt is... Um, not hard nor easy to write for he's the hero but he is the one straight man uh even stanley steamer i think has more comedic lines than matt does matt has uh almost minimal comedic lines so um he he was neither uh matt wasn't fun but i didn't dislike writing for matt matt was just yeah this is matt you know and right um but uh, the rest of the characters are uh, done a lot. But really, it comes down to uh, segueing into favorite scenes. It's like it's it's the scene and it's the joke I'm setting up. Uh, I don't think done a lot is uh, hard or easy to write for, and she's not necessarily my favorite. But setting up the jokes um, where she's involved, like in series one, where her name's the joke and running with that um you know i'm just done done a lot you look like you have um i'm just done i done a lot i bet you have um and uh bringing that out putting that all together um and, and that goes into my favorite scenes um uh, because in the end um it's a comedy and there are certain jokes and scenes uh, that I I do like more and now unfortunately series three is fresh in my brain it's the most recent series um, but if I go to series one um, the scenes were Bobby the kid and um, Five Finger Bill interact. I, I just, I love all of them, um, including the dressing up in, as grandpa and granddaughter, uh, but just the constant insults, the barrage of insults that Bobby throws. Bobby has a million different um, poetic um, insults, uh, allusions, references, um, for fecal matter, for shit. Uh, you metal muffin, you prairie pudding, you, you know, he's just got, they're all alliterative. <laughs> and um, he's just got a, dozens of them. Um, and, and that's some of my favorites. Um, you know, there's quick jokes like all the, um, the thing is, I love running gags. I love running jokes. A joke that just goes on and on, like the Don a lot jokes. You know, I'm just on a Don a lot. You look like you have. Um, the up Nellie's pass running jokes. Uh, 
throughout series one especially um i i i like run, running jokes like uh smoky in series three smoky trying to do his usual rants and keeps getting cut off and interrupted um throughout series three that that was fun to do and and so i i just love running jokes as opposed to maybe specific scenes and some jokes take forever to set up um for example one of my favorite scenes a uh, very recent favorite scene since i'm talking about them a lot involved these two where they are um in the cells um at the the mine these are cells that the kahat built in series two and um she's tied up and chained uh so is silas um and she's doing her usual bit which is she's so sexy she's so alluring she's just used to she wiggles her breast you know puts a little swagger in her hips and heterosexual men just fall backwards for her um and joyce does a great job voicing her and giving her depth and persona and uh there's such a long story to it, but uh, Joyce, um, as I mentioned in a previous video, uh, we don't act the scenes out. We just recite each character's voices. So usually Joyce has heard the scene and heard the plot of the scene and uh, the lines. And because of what was going on in her personal life, um, work and stuff, she's been very busy, more you know, busier than normal, more distracted than normal. And I really, and I was writing in massive crunches trying to get this done uh, that I didn't read her a lot of the scenes. So she comes to read that scene and I have to explain, I want Daisy to sound like this. And we do a couple of practice read throughs uh, where she just reads the line. And then she says, well, how about if I read it like this? And um, immediately I'm like, perfect. That's exactly how to do it. Um, so then we record it, but she's, she's so used to her feminine allures working. So she just, she's chained to the wall. She's like, Oh, help, help, help. Like she's mailing it in that old phrase. She just, she's not putting much effort behind it now. She's, you know, the guy will come in, he'll stare at me and immediately fall sucker to whatever I'm setting him up for. And so if you watch the scene, you already know what I'm talking about. Oh, help, 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 help. And the guard's like, shut up in there. Oh, help, help me. And he comes up, what's your problem? You know, you want to leave me in such a bad situation. What? What's your problem? Well, here I am chained with my breast hanging and, you know, uh, helpless to stop anybody from attacking me. And he's like, that's not going to work on me. And Silas is like, good God, man, are you a eunuch? And she's like, help, oh, help, help. Just as bored with the whole routine um, you know, just expecting it to work. Like, come on, any second now, you'll, you'll pop. And he says, this isn't going to work. And Joyce just deadpans it with the shock. Like, they won't? Why not? And he goes, because I'm gay. You know, I was specifically assigned to prevent you from doing this. Which you never see that in a movie. Um, and... Uh, and then to follow it up was the scene that really had Joyce busting over when she finally saw how it played out because she didn't know that part until she saw me put together where there's, because I'm gay, ma'am. And then there there's just this pause where we flash to the three faces. Nobody says anything, but we're trying to do that. They're all looking at each other like, and Silas goes, oh, well then, uh, hello, sailor. <laughs> Fancy meeting you here. And um, the guy responds to that and then gets knocked out. And um, so that's one of my, right there, that's one of my favorite scenes. Um, another favorite bit was uh, the whole scene in series one when uh, Five Finger Bill at the time uh, goes to the Emporium, the Explosives Emporium, uh, to pick up the dynamite that a gang member of Bobby is supposed to have set aside for him to use in destroying the Black Mamba. And there's so much miscommunication between them. And there's a, it's a Annie Wan's brother, Sam Wan. And there's one armed Sal who's a complete nincompoop uh, who likes to play catch with nitroglycerin bottles. 
which is why he's one-armed Sal. And uh, the whole scene is just very comedic. So by itself, I love that scene. But there's a part two to that scene, which is a little bit later, Bobby comes up and Bill knows the Emporium blew up. He didn't do it. He knows one arm Sal did, but he wasn't going to say anything because Annie Wan would be all upset about her brother and he's not saying anything. So when they pull up and uh, they're talking to uh, the miners, what happened? All oh, that idiot blew up his dynamite Emporium. And immediately... Uh, Annie Wan starts thinking about her brother. Where's my brother? My brother, has anybody seen my brother? Where, Where's my brother? And the miner just cold-heartedly says, based on the explosion, I'd say he's in Kansas by now. <laughs> and it's just, you know, if you realize they're in the southwestern United States and Kansas is much further north and east, um, you know, th th it's just a very vicious cold joke. So that that will always be one of my, my favorite scenes. Um, and then... Since I've picked one from series three and one from series one, let's go to series two. And uh, it involves, of course, the fav my favorite character of series two, uh, the Kahat. And um, it was probably the least watched scene of series three and uh, had the fewest views, the fewest likes, and it's my favorite. So it just tells you uh, how my view of my comedy versus apparently the general public. But... It's a backstory. It's like a 12, 13 minute video and eight minutes of it is just the Kahat telling his life story, how he got to where he is now. And he just talks about his, uh, uh, first of all, his parents name, his father was John Thomas Stevens, John Thomas, and uh, who was a British uh, worker for the um, Dutch East India Company. And... Uh, or the the British the East India the British East India Company, um, and uh, his mom was the daughter of the ruling uh, vizier of Can Understand, and uh, her name was uh, Princess Dianis. Dianis, and it was a little bit of a pun on Princess Di, but also Anis. So we have the line he talks about, and when. John Thomas met Dionys, you know, so just another sexual, crude, sexual innuendo joke. Um, but then he talks about how his parents, uh, you know, had to go into hiding um, and his paternal grandfather and his maternal grandfather both kind of rejected him and would have nothing to do with him, which hardened his heart. And then how he comes back and kills them both and how they die and is just very cold-hearted, smart-assery. That entire scene, I love. And there are many. Obviously, I like all the scenes. Um, but those those are uh, one scene from each of the series that just stand out to me as were uh, fun and laughing. And one other from series two uh, was, um, just because it's special, uh, I'm not going to enlarge this, but... If you look at this quickly, this is the oldest bit of comedy of mine still existing. This was written in 1981 uh, or 1980, 1980, 1981. So around there, I was around 16 going on 17. And uh, it's where I was uh, basically I was in a private religious school, uh, high school, and uh just being me, a subversive revolutionary. And uh, so I wrote, uh, I basically was writing a mockumentary religion. Um, and uh, I created this religion called Frisbetarianism, and I created this prophet Freebius and all this stuff. And uh, I had books in this their Bible, you know, the book of titillations, the book of libations, and, and so on and so on. And so Reverend Saltine, his preachings, when you hear his preachings, if you go, oh my God, that's so juvenile. And yeah, because it's the oldest surviving comedy bits I've written um, that I still have. So it's some of my oldest jokes. Uh, those, those entire quotes when he's and Freebius and the Lord said to Freebius, you begin it to pisseth me off and uh, thou shalt go and feel this. And you, 
um, I was fornicated, uh, I fornicated and was fornicated, um, you know, just all these goofy um, turns of phrases and such. Um, that's some of my oldest stuff. So it was fun to bring that out and have a character to give me an excuse to bring out this old uh, bits of comedy. There's about four pages here, and this was just one section, but this was typed in the er very early 1980s. Um, and, uh, a lot of, a lot of fun with that. So, um, yeah, I think that probably answers the questions of my characters that I, um, liked writing for. I, I enjoyed writing all of them and creating them. Some could be a little harder than others and my favorite scenes. So, uh, I will go ahead and end that on that note. And until the next video, I'll say, I'll be and choose and happy trains. Everybody take care.